Thank you for coming to our most recent NASA Google Talk. Um, we are pleased to welcome Steve Hipskin today. Is that, is that right? Pronouncing it correctly. Uh, Steve is the chief of the Earth Science Division at NASA Ames. He has been at NASA Ames for 35 years and is retiring in three days. So we caught him right before he left. Uh, he's going on a nine day backpacking trip to celebrate his 35 years. Steve has done a a whole slew of exploration in the Arctic and the subarctic and um, many places in between and we're really pleased to have them today. So please help me. Welcome. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Um, I'd like to thank Terry Fong for suggesting this and Mary for inviting me. It's always a lot of fun to, to come and talk about your passion. So I uh, appreciate you guys coming here today. I, I am going to talk about NASA's Earth Science Program, so I'm guessing people here kind of know what that's all about, but uh, a lot of times uh, people have no clue that the NASA actually studies the Earth. Um, but before I get into that, I wanted to give a little shout out to our friends in, in planetary science. Uh, we had one of the co-investigators on the New Horizons mission, which just did the flyby of the the dwarf planet Pluto, um, but very exciting event. We had a lot of people over at Ames uh, that were watching kind of the real-time feed, and uh, actually Dr. Cruikshank, who was our co-investigator, was actually at the Applied Physics Lab at Johns Hopkins for the for the fun and excitement. So this um, this mission was selected for um, for uh, uh, to go ahead in 2001. Uh, it actually launched in 2006, so it's, uh, it took nine years to get to uh, Pluto. Uh, that's uh, three billion miles, so if you figure that out, it's about 40,000 miles an hour. So this is a picture of uh, approaching the dwarf planet at about a million uh, kilometers out. So uh, the other interesting thing about the New Horizons mission is it was because it had to go so far, it was intended to be a pretty simple mission. Uh, its, its instruments were not articulated, so uh, you had to move the spacecraft to, to view the planet. But that meant that you couldn't view the planet and do communications because you had to turn the spacecraft to do communications. So as they were doing the flyby, um, they, they turned communications off so that they could do all of the observations. Uh, but the bandwidth to get that data, three billion miles from, from that far away in the solar system, is two kilobits a second. So it's taking a while to get all of the data that they took um, on the mission. So again, this is from a, a I'm sorry, this was, this was from about a million, a hundred million miles out, a hundred million kilometers out. Um, this was at about 50 million kilometers. And then as they got a little bit closer, yeah, they started seeing what they thought was a heart-shaped uh, feature on the planet. Uh, but the closest approach, this is a release for the first time ever, they found Pluto. So pretty exciting stuff. Um, OK. <laughs> um, what I'm, what I'm going to talk about is, is really uh, NASA's Earth Science Program. So I don't know, does everybody recognize this image? Know what year this image was taken? Any, any ideas? 1968. So it was actually the first mission to the moon where they actually just went around the moon and uh, didn't land on the moon. So this was actually, I think it was uh, Christmas Eve on, uh, in 1968. But you know, this really demonstrated the power of using the space uh, observation perspective to look back at our home planet. It really, I mean, this was at a time where environmental issues were just coming to the fore. Uh, it was when the Environmental Protection Agency was created, the Environmental Protection Act. Uh, so pretty exciting stuff. But a lot of people, if you follow politics at all, you recognize that there are certain people in the country that don't think NASA should be doing earth science. And um, to them, uh, we can look at the uh, authorizing legislation of, of NASA, which actually, if you look at what, 
that authorizing legislation asks us to do, the first, the first priority is the expansion of human knowledge um, of the Earth and phenomena in the atmosphere. Um, so clearly it's in our charter, but it's actually only been since the human spaceflight program that we've uh, really focused on a program to look at the Earth from space. T minus and, 10. And so. Nine, eight, seven. Yeah, that's funny. Six, it's not showing the same way I'm four, So three, this is a little two, picture of what we do. Zero, have ignition and lift off of the Atlas V rocket on the Landsat Data Continuity Mission, continuing the 40 year legacy of deserving Earth's natural resources from space. So probably a lot of you have heard about Landsat. It's really the oldest Earth-observing Earth program that we have at NASA. It started in the early 1970s. And so it's been almost a continuous 40-year uh, record of Earth observation. And for the kind of stuff that we're trying to do on the Earth, uh, the, the time series aspect of these observations is absolutely critical to, to really understanding what's going on on our home planet. Um, so this next video is just a time lapse, uh, again, through the Landsat program of changes to this particular urban area. Does everybody recognize where that urban area is? Shout it out. Come on now. Las Vegas. So actually, this is uh, showing a full 40-year uh, history of the development of Las Vegas, and if you watch this closely, you can see that basically went from a very small, you know, confined area around the Strip to now uh, really building out into the desert there to the um, to the left of the of the downtown and to the left of the image. So again, um, it's it's really that time continuity of these observations that really gives us the ability to look at what's going on on the planet. And so some of the other things that we can do uh, with this perspective from space is we can look at the biological productivity on the Earth. This is the CWIFS mission, uh, but this basically shows, this is a six year sequence showing the seasonal greening of the, of the planet and then the receding uh, in the winter months. Uh, but again, uh, just a simple time series of that image shows very quickly uh, a global snapshot of what's going on with the biosphere. Uh, so what is, what is NASA's um, ambition? Uh, it's, it's a pretty modest ambition to try to understand and model the whole planet. And so this, this was actually a diagram. It's actually a famous diagram called the Bretherton diagram that was actually created in the late eight, uh, 19, 1980s. Uh, but it, it basically tried to um, pictorialize the, all of the different subsystems on the Earth and the interconnected nature of these subsystems and the challenge of trying to understand you know, the nature of those systems, but also the interconnections of those systems, so systems of systems. And you'll notice there on the um, Right-hand side is the human activities. Uh, that's not something that we have focused on very much in the history of the Earth Science Program, but it's something that we're beginning to really put more focus on, and I'll get, I'll get back to that in a minute. Um, so what do we do to try to understand all of these subsystems? This is the current constellation of NASA satellites, and so we have this constellation. They're currently somewhere between 18 and 20. Uh, Earth observing satellites from NASA that are currently up there. And then the, the colored coding shows the existing constellation and the missions that are in development and, and uh, planned for a future launch. But it's a, it's a fairly uh, complex endeavor. People typically don't think of NASA when they think about doing Earth science, but we actually have the largest Earth science program on the planet. And it's largely because it's fairly expensive to do these kinds of space-based space missions. Um, so this, uh, this next uh, image is just, it's just an image of you know, what these satellites look like in space. And so typically for Earth observation, we have what are called sun-synchronous polar orbits, which means the satellites are crossing the same place on the Earth at the same time 
but they're doing it in polar orbit so that as the Earth rotates, we eventually uh, image the entire planet. And so this, again, is, is a sequence of those constellations. One thing you'll notice is um, there's a, a bunch of them. I'll show this in a second. But there are a bunch of them that, uh, for the first time, we've been attempting to fly uh, several of the satellites in close formation. Uh, and, and basically, that just leverages the power of getting these co-located you know, co in time observations, which uh, makes it makes it much easier to do some of the analysis. Uh, in the last oh, year and a half, we've launched a number of new satellites, the Global Precipitation Mission, which is one of the things that I didn't say is that the work that we do is very heavily interagency. So there are a lot of agencies in the US that have a piece of Earth science. Typically, other agencies have kind of operational responsibility. NOAA does uh, weather forecasting. USGS does earthquake. Um, observation and uh, response. And, and indeed, a lot of what we do is, is uh, we actually build and launch the satellites. So we build and launch the satellites for NOAA, for the weather satellites. We also, Landsat is fundamentally a, a US Geological Survey mission, but we build and launch that satellite as well. Um, the, the Global Precipitation mission is a, an example of the inter, international flavor of what we do. And so, the Japanese actually built the, the, um, the radar on the GPM mission. Um, but if you think about it, you know, two thirds of the planet is ocean. And so other than having these space-based observations, there no, there's no way to get precipitation measurements over the ocean, over a big part of the planet. So it's only been since we've been doing these observations from space that we have a critical component of what you know, the weather system on the planet, but also you know, how the climate system is changing, how precipitation around the planet is changing. Uh, SMAP is one of the most recent uh, missions that we've launched. It's the soil, mes uh, soil moisture measurement uh, using an L-band radar tuned to uh, humidity in the top you know, several centimeters of soil. But again, for the first time, we have a global picture of what the soil moisture looks like, which is hugely important for, for example, agricultural water demand and things like that. Unfortunately, uh, SMAP has only been up for um, uh, several months. And uh, it has two instruments, a radar and a radiometer. They're having problems with the uh, radar right now. We've gotten some global data sets. But right now, the, uh, the instrument is. Um, is being debugged to try to figure out what's going on with the radar. We still have the radiometer, which also provides a soil moisture, but not with the same level of spatial uh, resolution as the radar uh, instrument. I mentioned the constellation. We refer to it as the A-train, which is largely making atmospheric measurements. And so again, we fly. These uh, satellites are, are flying within a minute of each other uh, in terms of when they actually cross a particular place on the, uh, on the Earth. And so I mentioned you know, one of our challenges really is to better understand the impact of human activity. And if you read the little blurb in, in uh, the introduction to the talk, uh, I want to show you some of the measurements that are really truly the uh, measurements from space that are, that are really most uniquely uh, showing human presence on the planet. And that's, that's the nighttime images. So you've seen a lot of the night lights images. They have a lot of global images. Um, this actually is an image that was taken from the International Space Station by, by one of the astronauts, actually Don Pettit, who uh, actually is from Oregon State. Uh, but he actually figured out how to take their cameras. He actually took a Makita drill and created his own motion compensation. Because of course, the satellites are, the space station is traveling at thousands of miles an hour. And so trying to take a picture of the, of the Earth is a little bit challenging. They actually have much faster cameras. This was done probably close to 10 years ago now. But the, the really neat thing that you can see from night lights images, particularly these ones from the space station, which are much higher resolution than the other satellites where you've seen night light images, uh, you can really start to see not just the presence of humans, but you can see different aspects of human activity. For example, you can easily pick out transportation corridors. You can pick out industrial sections, uh, cities. You can see San Francisco there at the 
top end of the bay is very brightly colored. And so one of the things that you can do is begin to use this as a surrogate for where the carbon emissions are. That's not so much of a problem in the United States because we have a lot of other information that tells us that. But around the rest of the world, and particularly the developed countries that don't have that kind of data taking capability, uh, it's a really nice way to pinpoint where the carbon emissions are coming from uh, in terms of writing carbon treaties and things like that. The other uh, fantastic thing about night lights, which I find really intriguing, is the, the extent to which you can see the impacts of human decision making. And so, so we all very much benefit in the Bay Area from decisions that were made in the 50s and 60s where people set aside open space in the Bay Area. So what you see there, of course, is Silicon Valley, San Francisco at the top end of the Bay, San Jose at the bottom end. But what you don't see is where the mountains are because we've kept development out of the hills for the most part. And so you can see that very clearly in an image like this. It's even actually more striking in this image, which is of Washington, DC. And for those of you know, that know Washington, DC, you know that it was developed as a 10, 10 mile on a side square, turned on its side, so it's a diamond. But the remarkable thing to me, the, the very bright lights are kind of the central DC, the mall area. But you can see the outline of that 10 mile square in this image with nothing other than lights. And so, you know, basically what that says is that people are making decisions in one neighborhood about nighttime lighting that are very different from the community next door. So uh, it's a very powerful tool for looking at um, human presence, changing human presence, um, and uh, impacts of human you know, policy management decisions on the Earth. Pretty exciting stuff. Um, you know, right now, uh, the, the regular satellite images are much lower resolution than these images. We at NASA Ames have really pushed hard to, to get NASA to think about putting up a, a nightlight uh, imager that would give you this kind of resolution, and you could really do some interesting things. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about public-private partnerships in a little bit, but I, I, I think this is one where, you know, if, if we don't do it in the government, I'm, I'm hopeful that others will find this uh, interesting and valuable enough to, to actually look at doing. Um, so one of the other things that we do at NASA, and because we can't see all of the detailed geophysical phenomenon from space just because we're so far away, um, and it, it is interesting how it's, it's changing all the time in terms of our capabilities. But one of the other tools that we have in the tool set is aircraft. And so NASA has historically had uh, aircraft that focus on high altitude measurements. Uh, so that aircraft in the upper left, for example, is, is really a converted U-2 spy plane that we've converted uh, to do geophysical measurements. Uh, we've had that since the early 70s. We actually started the NASA Airborne Program at NASA Ames back in the 70s. You notice that we paint ours white. So we're the good guys. Um, but uh, more recently, we've been starting to use the NASA Global Hawk, which is the aircraft on the upper right, which is kind of a replacement for the U-2. Uh, flies roughly the same altitude, roughly the same payload capability. But it really allows us to get to places on the planet, particularly in the upper atmosphere, that we just, there's no other way to get to those kinds of measurements. And so again, um, even though people don't really think of Earth science when they think of NASA, we actually have the, the largest uh, airborne program uh, of any agency on the planet as well. The, the DC-8 in the lower left is just a, an old commercial airliner, but we've pretty much stripped it completely bare so that we can actually put laboratory uh, size instruments in that aircraft. And we have a really nice uh, program every summer. It's actually called the Student Airborne Research Program. So if any, any students out there in the audience are interested in doing this, uh, we actually bring in about 30 students from around the country. Uh, we actually put instruments on the aircraft. That's a picture of some of the students on the aircraft. Uh, they take the data, they develop their own research project, and then they actually take the data, do their uh, research and analysis, and then present at the end of the summer. 
it's a, a really exciting program, really hands-on opportunity to do, to do earth science. And so one of, the, one of the prime examples of how the airborne program really uh, plays is that in the 1980s, there was the ozone hole, and nobody really knew what was going on with that. Uh, NASA actually had just launched the Total Ozone Mapping Spectrometer, or TOMS. And so we could see those images of the, of the, um, the globe looking uh, f you know, down on the South Pole. Uh, we could see the ozone hole, but we couldn't, we couldn't determine what was causing it. So there were several theories at the time. It's uh, nitric, nitric oxides released by aircraft. There was a concern that there was just a climatological shift in the circulation patterns. But one of the top contenders was CFCs, the chlorofluorocarbons, and you know, whether those were really causing the ozone hole. It wasn't until we were able to take our high altitude aircraft, which was really the only way in the world to get these measurements. And we actually went down based out of Punta Arenas, which is on the Strait of Magellan at the southern tip of South America. And we were able to make measurements directly into the ozone hole, which was in the stratosphere over the, over the South Pole. And we were able to bring back, you know, what we've always referred to as the smoking gun. It showed that, you know, there was this tremendous correlation with the chlorine molecules that we were seeing, which ended up being the source of the ozone hole. And that, you know, the, the exciting thing about that for us is that that data that we took fed directly into international policy, which became the Montreal Protocol, which uh, basically caused all the, the developed countries to, to uh, phase out the development of CFCs. And uh, we averted losing our stratospheric uh, ozone layer, which protects us. Um, NASA scientists this, this is just a, a quick video clip of some of the other more recent work that we've done with the Global Hawk aircraft. But essentially, we put instruments on that aircraft. And in this case, we were very interested in what's the impact of climate change on the water cycle, and particularly how does water vapor go from the lowest part of the atmosphere into the stratosphere. Because if you get more water in the stratosphere, it actually has a huge impact on the ozone cycle and potentially and leads to more ozone center, reduction. We'll focus on um, small changes and so we actually, again, that may this was really the only way to get that data in the upper atmosphere over the, the middle of the Pacific. Recently uh, the Global Hawk gives us a new measurement Global domain because it can stay up in the air for 31 hours compared to the U-2, which can stay up for only about eight hours. And so we're actually able to go get those measurements. And indeed, in this project that we got funded here at NASA Ames, we actually showed that there's much more water vapor getting into the stratosphere than people had anticipated. So again, um, our stuff is not quite as sexy as uh, doing a flyby of the planets, but it's, it's really the stuff that NASA does that's most directly impactful to life here on Earth. Uh, another thing that we've done with aircraft, uh, this is actually a satellite image of the big wildfires in Southern California. This was actually in 2007. Uh, but again, uh, the satellite gives you kind of the overall picture, but in terms of decision making for the firefighters, it's not nearly enough uh, detail. And um, so we embarked on this program where we put uh, a very high dynamic range infrared sensor on the Akana UAV and really changed the way that the US fights fires. Uh, we actually worked with folks in Terry's organization in intelligent systems and took some of the autonomy and intelligent planning and scheduling and repurposed actually uh, software that was developed for the Mars rovers and repurposed that for uh, managing the data coming down from the UAV, uh, put together a satellite link, uh, onboard processing, on the aircraft so that we were able to generate. So, so the image on the left there is what the firefighter sees on the ground. It's very hard to see kind of where the fire fronts are, where it is relative to the terrain. And so with the infrared sensor, we're able to look through the smoke, determine where the hot spots are, where the fire fronts are. And then we actually use Google Earth because that was very standardized in the firefighting community and we're able to show them where these fire fronts were and were moving. And so they, for the first time ever, used real-time data that we were giving them from NASA, and they were using that to make decisions about putting boots on the ground. 
Uh, typically, they had done infrared imagery before, but they would go up in an aircraft, take the data, aircraft would land, there would be a group that would process the data, and maybe six hours later, the firefighters got those images. Well, a lot happens in six hours in a big fire, so we were giving them real-time images, and indeed, uh, we were doing you know, basically a web-based distribution, so our data was going directly onto the incident command center set up for the big wildfires, and that was going up on their boards within five minutes of taking the data. And so you know, NASA doesn't fight fires, and so one of our challenges is kind of the research operations. You know, how do we transfer this technology into the hands of the agency who has the responsibility, in this case the U.S. Forest Service, for fighting fires, and so they've actually adopted what we refer to as a collaborative decision environment, this software, and that, now they use that at NIFSI, the National Interagency Fire Center in Boise, and they actually use that software to manage wildfires across the United States. Um, we also gave them on permanent loan the infrared sensor, so they actually can duplicate the capabilities that we demonstrated. Uh, we're more recently looking at using smaller um, robotic aircraft. Um, the images in the left there are of our Sierra aircraft, which you know, we went from not ever using this for science to going to Svalbard, which is the island owned by and, and north of Norway, so above the Arctic Circle. So we kind of went from testing this thing out here at, at Ames to going to one of the most extreme environments on the planet. But we demonstrated that you can fly these aircraft for about 10 hours and return useful data. In this case, we were looking at the surface roughness of the Arctic ice sheets to look at um, can you um, determine the age of the ice from remote sensing uh, and improve your uh, remote sensing algorithms from space. Uh, the image in the lower right there is actually some much smaller aircraft, actually Dragon Eyes. And we were able to work with, uh, actually in this case, NASA JPL that had a very small uh, SO2 sensor. And we were able to fly these. This is actually Mount, um, Mount Terrialba in uh, Costa Rica. And so we were actually able to demonstrate that we could fly these aircraft actually at much higher than they had originally been intended to fly. And we could, do, you know, we could look at sulfur dioxide uh, emissions coming out of the volcanoes. And so our next step, actually, this summer is to uh, fly these aircraft in formation, and so rather than having to talk individually to the aircraft, talk to them as a group, and be able to do um, more broad, broader spatial measurements with these uh, small platforms. And then uh, another, uh, so this is a little bit of the public-private partnership. I don't know how many of you know that your uh, principals actually have a bunch of uh, private aircraft that they keep over at Moffett Field. And one of, the, one of the quid pro quos of this public-private partnership is they've allowed us to put our scientific instruments on this uh, aircraft that they own. It's called an Alpha Jet. And so we've um, developed a greenhouse gas payload that we put on there to measure CO2, methane, uh, ozone, water vapor, et cetera. And the image in the middle there, um, one of the things that we do with satellite observations that the aircraft program is very helpful for is doing uh, validation of the satellite images. So we look at places on the planet. This is the Railroad Valley, which is a very high, very uniform playa in the high desert in Nevada. But with this partnership, we can actually make very routine measurements that we wouldn't otherwise be able to make if we had to uh, proposed to use the NASA aircraft, which are in very high demand. So we've been making these measurements over Railroad Valley every month for the last five years. So it's a very powerful tool. Uh, and this is just a, a little image. We were working with the Japanese, who also are measuring CO2 from space. So this is a Japanese team that were actually in Railroad Valley um, making measurements of uh, CO2 and methane. So we're able to fly the Alpha Jet from here at Moffett Field and fly right over that playa. And then we have them circle up and do a vertical profile to compare to the satellite measurements. Uh, so it's a, it's a really exciting uh, capability. It's, it's actually kind of fun because we try to get the profiles as close to the surface What's as we can. This is probably a little bit closer than we expected them to do. But uh, you, know, you can't say we're not close to the surface with those measurements. 
So, you know, what do we do with all of this information? Uh, the, the whole idea is to try to not only understand, but to be able to predict what's going to happen in the future. This is a really nice, colorful image of some modeling work that's actually done at NASA Goddard in Maryland. But it's looking at the atmospheric aerosol, and it's color-coded by uh, aerosol source. But you know, very high resolution meteorological analyses showing how aerosols, for example, from Saharan Africa get transported across the Atlantic. Um, so again, this is the ultimate goal of that uh, Bretherton diagram, is to put all of this in information together and be able to predict into the future. One of the things that we're doing at NASA Ames is uh, what we call the NASA Earth Exchange. It's actually very similar to, and we've had some collaborative relationships with the Google Earth Engine folks here at, at, uh, at Google. Uh, but we, we can use that to really uh, assimilate all of these very large satellite data sets into a single place and then have the data co-located with the various analytics and, and uh, large models. In this particular case, we're using it to look at uh, irrigation demand in the Central Valley of the US. We had done a lot of work up in Napa Valley doing that for grapes. Uh, so we had the opportunity a few years ago to scale this up. And now we're looking at the whole Central Valley. But we're showing that you can actually reduce the amount of uh, irrigated water uh, to a kind of an optimum level, still maintain the same level of agricultural productivity, uh, but fairly significantly reduce the water. In some in some side by side tests in the Salinas Valley, we were able to demonstrate that you could maintain productivity with up to 35 percent reduction in water. You're not going to get that across the whole Central Valley, but even if you could save five to seven percent of the water usage in California, that would be huge. Um, Another thing that we've been able to do with the NASA Earth Exchange is uh, climate downscaling. We've actually recently scaled this up to the whole planet. But this is taking the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and kind of the best models that come out of that group. Um, I thought that was set up to repeat, but let me see if I can show that again. This is basically just showing from current to 2100 uh, what the, the state-of-the-art models show for temperature in the United States, which actually, if you look at this, it's pretty scary because you, you can see that the whole central part of the United States uh, actually looks a lot like the southwestern United States by 2100. That's using the scenario of not a lot of carbon reduction, but it's really kind of the scenario that we're currently on. So it's actually a pretty accurate uh, portrayal. One other example I'll show really quickly. Uh, this is some recent work mapping fallowed fields in California. Again, just using remote sensing, but using fairly sophisticated uh, analysis tools to get to you know, what's a fallowed field versus just you know, a roadway or whatever. And so we're, we're um, producing these maps. Uh, this is from 2011 to 2015. But you can track the increasing amount of fallowed fields in the Central Valley, which is basically a direct impact of the drought on uh, California agriculture. And so this, this work has been used by the California Department of Water Resources to brief, to brief the governor's uh, uh, drought task force. It's actually been, uh, it actually just came out last week uh, in a, a White House missive on, you know, what is, what, are, what is the U.S. government doing to address climate change? So this. Uh, data was featured in that as well. Um, so I'm, I'm going to quickly shift gears and talk about some of the interesting stuff that we're doing at Ames and doing and looking at uh, again remote sensing. Um, this is what we end up calling fluid lensing. But uh, in my humble opinion, I actually think this has the possibility of completely re revolutionizing the way we do uh, remote sensing. Um, and so what you're seeing here is an image of the Venus transit of the sun that happened several years ago. And so this is an image of the sun. Of course, the black spot is the Venus transit of, of the sun. Uh, but the remarkable thing is uh, we were able to get this kind of detail on the surface of the sun. And you would think that that might be a satellite um, 
cir circulating around the sun, but this is actually this, the telescope that those images were taken from. And so normally, when you have a piece of glass, that gives you the diffraction limit. It limits your spatial resolution that you can see. But what, what uh, this young uh, researcher, Vey Chariath, is doing is actually using atmospheric turbulence as a lens. And so it basically gets around the limitation of having to put big, giant pieces of glass in space and allows you to use the atmosphere to, to lens those images. And so I actually got him to do some work in earth science. And so I asked him if he could take that same technique and look downward and you know, what could you do? And so he actually recognized that one really interesting thing that you could do is uh, uh, imaging uh, shallow water ecosystems. And so this is actually an image at the Stanford pool. Uh, that's Vade on the right uh, looking up. And so he's got a little uh, logo uh, that's hung above the pool. And you can see you know, that's what it would look like if you're sitting on the bottom of the pool. But if you apply the image, the, the fluid lensing, so basically in this case, you're using that air-water interface and the waves. And you can imagine that when the wave goes by, it actually acts as a lens. And it, it, it both magnifies and sharpens the image. And so you can go from that image in the upper left to that image in the lower, lower left. Uh, so you can see that it actually is slightly magnified from the real image but also basically gives you an accurate portrayal of what's really there. And so he's, he's taken this. He's actually put it on a, a small quadcopter UAV. And he's imaged two places now. One was the coral reefs in American Samoa. And this is actually in Shark Bay in Australia, where these, uh, there are these stromatolite pools. Stromatolites are the oldest living organisms on the planet. They're responsible for creating the oxygen in the atmosphere. And this is the first time anyone's ever gotten permission to actually do uh, flying over remote sensing of Hamlin Pool. Uh, but this is uh, what you would see from that imagery if you're just flying along. And this is applying the fluid lensing technique. So he's actually generated literally centimeter scale three-dimensional images of both these stromatolites as well as the coral reefs. And it gives you this incredibly powerful capability for the first time to use remote sensing to do things like uh, identify species differentiation in coral reefs. And so you can look at you know, impacts of changing climate on uh, specific species in the coral reefs. Um, so I'll, I'll finish by just saying that um, you know, we, as humans on this planet, face tremendous issues uh, environmentally. And it really takes much more than the US government or all of the governments. It takes all of us working on these problems. And so you know, I, I really personally feel that public-private partnerships are an important way going forward in that um, uh, it's, it's really a way to leverage the, the financial resources that uh, companies like Google and others can bring to the table. And looking at uh, different ways to get this, these measurements or different ways to analyze that data um, this, this actually looks like a cartoon picture. This is actually the launch of some CubeSats from the International Space Station. That one in the center is actually uh, what was referred to as PhoneSat at the time, but it's, it's the same guys that were working at Ames that went off and created Planet Labs up in San Francisco. Um, but you know, I think it's really important for uh, private sector companies like Skybox, like Planet Labs, to really push the federal government, because we're not the most uh, fast-paced, nimble organization on the planet. Um, but it, it, you know, it, there's sort of this balance, because it's important to have the you know, sort of the long-term view, which the, the US government has, uh, combined with sort of new capabilities, new ideas. And I, I think that's the way that we're going to move forward and solve some of these problems that we face. So thank you very much. Appreciate being here. That fluid lens must be highly irregular, yeah? Highly irregular? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not a nice smooth lens like a lens in my telescope. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So I mean, there's, there's a tremendous amount of compute power that, I mean, we're, we actually 
So those original images were created with a GoPro, uh, which, which is pretty remarkable when you see what he was able to retrieve. But he's actually gotten some funding from the Earth Science Technology Office, which is our technology development at NASA, to build much more sophisticated cameras, which, which also have incredibly uh, powerful CPUs on them to do the image processing. It's essentially machine vision, because uh, you, you have to sort of look at the scale of the turbulence, and then you have to figure that out, and then you have to be able to stitch all that together. So it's, it's a pretty challenging uh, problem. But we're, we're, we've actually just put in a proposal to put those cameras, which are kind of state-of-the-art video cameras. I think they are 4K by 4K imagers that are doing like 90 images a second. So it's a tremendous amount of data that's being generated, tremendous uh, problem to solve in terms of just processing the data. But we're, we're hoping that that proposal will be successful and we'll launch these things into space and test, test what he's done on a quadcopter uh, from space, see what we can get. So the dome actually uh, covers uh, a large steerable antenna. And so, you know, of course, we're dependent on satellite communication to use that aircraft because we're we're typically sending it from Southern California. We can send it all the way to Australia and back. So we need a way to communicate uh, with the aircraft uh, in flight. So um, yeah, so there's a big rotating dish that sits under that, that big dome. Unfortunately for us, it takes a lot of payload space, so we, we complain about that. We'd like them to shrink the dish, but if any of you guys have any ideas. And, you know, one of the challenges that we face in earth science is there's so many things that we need to understand that it's hard to sort of pick. In fact, you know, we as a community have a hard time prioritizing where we should put our uh, uh, resources because of that reason. Uh, in fact, one of the things that NASA does is it, it seeks input from the community through the National Research Council. And we actually, every 10 years, we generate what's called a decadal survey. And so we actually ask you know, the smartest people in the country to give us those priorities. Um, I think more and more, uh, you know, what, one thing that's becoming more and more important is spatial resolution and the ability to see things at much finer detail. Because we're getting to the point where our models can actually give us, we're, we're getting projections down to regional and local scales but we need the data sets to corroborate the model results. So, so r model results. And so clearly spatial resolution is a big one. Um, you know, just coming up with new kinds of measurements, the, I didn't show it, but the uh, results from the, the soil moisture measurement, we showed uh, the global picture of soil moisture and it's hugely impactful because again, for the first time you have this global picture of what things look like. Unfortunately, one of the things that was most striking is how similar Saharan Africa was to the Western United States now in terms of soil moisture. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's, it's very hard to pick uh, top priorities. Uh, I, I mean, I think we're sort of moving down that road. I mean, the, the global precipitation measurement has been huge in terms of understanding. That's one of the biggest uncertainties that we have now in, in climate models is understanding what climate change will do to precipitation. Um, you know, one of our big uh, focuses at NASA Ames is better trying to understand clouds and aerosols because they're again one of the more um, uh, the largest uncertainties in our ability to the forecast climate because depending on the type of cloud and, and the location of the cloud in the atmosphere, it can either have a heating effect or a cooling effect. And so uh, better understanding uh, that phenomenon. In fact, we, we just got funded, uh, a little plug for, for us, um, we just got funded for a five-year project where we're gonna base uh, actually the ER-2 aircraft out of um, uh, Western Africa and there's a phenomenon there similar to the west coast of the United States where you get a low stratus deck, but they have an awful lot of uh, biomass burning. And so you get the smoke that comes off of the, the continent, creates a bunch of the aerosol that generates cloud condensation nuclei. And so it's a perfect place on the planet for us to try to better understand how you distinguish between these aerosol particles and the clouds underneath them. And so. 
Uh, and that one, you really need those very detailed measurements that you can only get from an aircraft. So I guess my wish list is to uh, or change the uh, NASA budget by an order of magnitude. How about that? <laughs> How do you get the data back to farmers in an actionable way? Well, so that, that's, uh, uh, again, an excellent question. And indeed, you know, one of the, the really the strengths of that project that we're doing in the Central Valley is that we're working with the California Department of Water Resources, who has an irrigation forecast system. We're working with the Western Growers Association. We're working with a number of growers, both large and small. So like uh, we actually have had some of the growers have approached us because they've heard about the work. So we just about a year ago ha uh, had Gallo come and asked to be part of this program. And so we, we work very much hand in glove with the growers to see you know, what their needs are. If you notice that one little image I showed, the ultimate is to have it on a, you know, a smartphone or a, a you know, mobile device. Because the farmers typically aren't sitting at their computers uh, in, back in their homes. They're typically out in the field trying to figure out what's going on. So uh, you know, we, we are definitely working with them to figure out what best meets their needs. Uh, again. Um, Classic case, though, of uh, sort of NASA, you know, we're a research and development agency. We're not an operational agency. So for us, when we demonstrate these things, part of it is just kind of figuring out how to hand that technology off, either to private companies that will sell those services or, uh, you know, other agencies like the U.S. Department of Agriculture that can adopt some of these capabilities. And they have a whole you know, agricultural research service where they could actually adopt some of these things and have it as one of their capabilities that they can share with the farmers. Do you ever release uh, your raw measurements data to the public or do you think it would make sense or not? Ah, great question. I'm glad you asked because that was one of the points I meant to make. Uh, NASA and the United States absolutely uh, sort of lead the world in the, in the fact that any data that we take becomes publicly available to everybody on the planet when we take it. And, and that's actually pushing a number of other space-faring countries to change their uh, data uh, policies. Um, but um, yeah, that's one of the beauties of, of what we do is we make that data publicly available. And so um, we actually have a data system that was set up when we started on this program of Earth Observation System, EOS. Uh, and, and indeed, we actually set up a data distribution system back before there was a World Wide Web. And so there's some uh, challenging, I mean, you know, NASA has tried to keep up. But uh, I think what we're doing at NASA Ames with the NASA Earth Exchange and what you guys are doing with uh, Google Earth Engine are exactly the kind of things that we need to be pushing forward in that um, you know, right now, uh, these data sets are in different archives around the country. And so the typical thing is for scientists to go download that data and run it on their home computer. And, and you know, uh, it was interesting in that NEX and Google Earth Engine had a very similar heritage in that they both recognized that you know, compute power has vastly improved. Storage has become easier and cheaper. But bandwidth hasn't really kept up. So, so really, the idea is bringing all that data next to the analytics and the models so that people have much more direct access. And so everybody's not trying to move big, giant quantities of data across the network. Um, but that's, that's facilitated by the fact that all of this data that we create is publicly available. Um, you showed the pictures of the ozone hole over Antarctica, and it didn't look, even though the, the accord was made reasonably long time ago, it didn't look like it was um, closing significantly by 2000. It wasn't growing. I well, um, I, I don't remember actually which years I showed. That was probably 2011 just 2011 was the latest line. Pardon? 2011 yeah. was the latest? Well, and, and so the interesting thing about that is one of the challenges with that is that the CFCs I mean, they were, they were developed in the 1930s to be extremely stable molecules. And so they have a very long lifetime in, in the atmosphere. And so we expected in the late 80s, early 90s, when they were looking at Montreal Protocol, that it would probably be about mid-century 
because the, these molecules have about a 50 to 60 year lifetime in the atmosphere. So it would probably be about mid-century. So what we do see, I mean, we monitor this stuff. And so what we do see is that there's been a tremendous uh, reduction, well, a reduction in the growth rate and actually a reduction in the total amount of chlorine getting into the stratosphere. But, you know, it's got such a long lag in the system that we don't expect the ozone hole to completely come back to pre-1980s until sometime around 2050. So come back and talk to me then, uh, and we'll let you know if our theories are right. So I know you said that um, you guys have, like, the largest earth science group doing research. Is budget always a concern? Like, do, how do you guys, like, lobby to get more money or spread education about earth science and stuff? So that's the beauty of being a, a civil servant. You know, we're, as NASA, we're an executive agency, so we actually work for the president. And so we, uh, if we lobby, we go to jail. Um, so we can only do outreach and talk about the great work that we do, uh, but we are explicitly um, prohibited from, from lobbying. But as you can imagine, it is a very political thing. And uh, for those of us that are very critically dependent, so you know, we're, we work for the president, but the Congress sets our budget. And uh, if you follow the Congress, you know that there's a certain party in the country that's not that interested in climate change. And, um, and so they actually tried to cut our budget by uh, about $600 million this year. Um, luckily, um, luckily, there's a lot of political theater that goes on. Uh, but when it comes down to actually generating the budget, uh, I think saner uh, heads prevail. And, and so uh, our budget looks like it's going to be fairly stable. So that's one of our challenges, is just trying to make sure that we have some stability in the budget, because uh, these missions are fairly expensive. And so when we get these big radical shifts in, from year to year, you know, we have you know, quite a few people that are working on these missions, and it's hard to start and stop. And um, you know, so for us, it's really just a matter of uh, recognizing, I mean, you, you can only really take the pulse of the planet if you're making the measurements. And so uh, you know, the more that we can get people um, to appreciate the importance of those continuous measurements, the better. But I mean, it's really our, our opportunity is to try to educate people as much as possible. Um, and it, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting in that I think, um, well, and so our budget, so in the last decadal survey that, that the National Research Council did, for example, you know, they gave us uh, a wish list of a program that probably would have taken at least twice the budget that we have now. And so we try to maintain a, a, a stable, executable program but knowing that we can't do everything that people would like us to do. And you know, then you get into conversations about national priorities and what's more important. But I, you know, I personally feel that you know, if, we, if we're really going to try to make progress in addressing climate change, it can't be just the federal government. It's got to be all of us you know, from individual actions but also corporate actions, which can be challenging because, of course, corporations have different uh, um, responsibilities to, say, shareholders. And so, it's, it, I mean, we've, we've entered into a number of public-private public partnerships, but you know, just getting the, the conversation going and speaking the same language can be a challenge. And so, uh, I, I think uh, you know, working toward those goals is, in my view, very important. But I, I think part of it is just getting people to understand, you know, the challenges that we face and, you know, what it takes to understand and, and address them. Okay, thank you.